Well, let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 8, shall we? Matthew chapter 8. Uh, we had mentioned in the beginning of Matthew chapter 8 that Matthew continues to reveal Jesus as the King, as the King of kings, as the Lord of lords. And we saw some healings by Jesus last time we were together. Matthew focused on four of the healings, uh, the healing of the leper, the centurion's servant, uh, Peter's mother-in-law, which was a miracle in and of itself. Um, from Peter's standpoint, just kidding. <laughs> and then it was the... Uh, The multitudes, the de demonic possessed multitudes. Sean, I'm surprised you missed that one. No donuts for you. Now, this brings us to kind of a switch in gears, if you will, from the healings of Jesus to following Jesus. So let's pick up our reading in verse 18, and we will read down through verse 34, the end of the chapter. Matthew chapter 8, beginning in verse 18. Now, when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave a command to depart to go to the other side. Then a certain scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, the Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Now when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him, and suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea so that the boat was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? <clears throat> Excuse me one second. <clears throat> Boy, that coffee this morning is kind of <clears throat> didn't quite all go down, I think. <clears throat> Verse 28. When, <laughs> when he had Come to the other side, to the country of the Gergesenes. There met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs exceedingly fierce so that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they cried out saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a good way off from them were a herd of many swine feeding. So the demons begged him saying, If you cast us out, permit us to go away into the herd of swine. And Jesus said to them, go. So when they had come out, they went into the herd of swine, and suddenly the whole herd of swine ran violently down the steep place into the sea and perished in the water. Then those who kept them fled, and they went away into the city and told everything, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to depart from their region. Wow, sad. Now, of course, just a cursory reading of our text today indicates that we switch gears from the healings of Jesus to what it means to be a follower of Jesus, following Jesus Christ, being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And the question is, what is involved in following Jesus Christ? Well, there's a great many things involved in following Jesus. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but if you're taking notes or outlining our study, there are four things mentioned in our text, four things that are involved in following Jesus. You know, yesterday, uh, Sally and I, we took our two grandsons, two of the three, down to the beach, as we have pretty much all summer, teaching them how to surf. And they're doing very well, by the way, uh, having a lot of fun. Yesterday was kind of a... Uh, another cornerstone in their surfing career in that I didn't have to go out in the water with them this time. They did it all on their own. It was very impressive. Uh, but on the way to the beach, they were in the back just talking 100 miles an hour, uh, Asher and Cohen, my two grand boys, grandsons. And then it got quiet because they were playing their little video games. And we're about halfway to the beach, and all of a sudden, Cohen 
seven and a half years old. My seven, he's, he's full of the spirit, this kid. He starts singing. I have decided to follow Jesus. I ha-. Okay, good. Nobody knows it. <laughs> so he starts singing this song, and it just brought tears to my eyes because, I mean, to have somebody seven and a half years old singing, I want to follow Jesus, blesses your heart. But in light of the text today, it was a miracle. It was amazing to see how God worked in his little heart and uh, in our study today in following Jesus. Super cool. Well, let's come to the first thing we want to look at that's involved in following Jesus. Number one, it involves forsaking. It involves forsaking. That's in verses 18 through 20. In verse 18 of Matthew 8, it says, Now when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave a command to depart to the other side. Now, according to verse 5, they were in Capernaum or Capernaum, the village of Nahum. They're on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, which according to Matthew chapter 9, verse 1, is called his own city. And we'll talk more about that, Lord willing, next time we're together. So they were leaving Capernaum, and they're going to cross over to the other side, to the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, to the city of uh, the area of the Gergesenes, or Gadara, or modern-day Kersey, and we'll talk more on that in just a moment. Well, then, according to verse 19, a certain scribe came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Now, a scribe is one who studies the law, one who teaches the law, one who is a follower of the law. Now, this particular scribe, no doubt, has been following Jesus. He's been watching the miracles of Jesus and no doubt is is very excited and moved by the work of Jesus Christ there in the northern shore of Galilee. So he decides that he now wants to study Jesus, be taught by Jesus and be a follower of Jesus. But Jesus cools his jets just a little bit. Uh, Take a look at verse 20. In verse 20, Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now, that little phrase, the Son of Man, uh, it's a phrase that Jesus often uses of himself. It's a messianic phrase. It's from one of uh, Daniel's night visions in Daniel chapter 7, verse 14, where he refers to the Messiah as the Son of Man. Now, the inference here to this scribe, this lawyer who wants to now follow Jesus, is that he needs to forsake everything and everyone to follow the Lord. Because Jesus said, look, birds have nests, foxes have holes, but I have no place to lay my head. In other words, if you want to follow me, you need to forsake everything to follow me. In fact, in Mark's gospel, in Mark chapter 8, verse 34, uh, Jesus said, if any man will come after me, in other words, if anybody wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, when people talk about taking up the cross, they think, well, you know, that's, it's a burden because the cross is heavy. And they think of a, a situation or a person in their life, well, my job or, you know, this situation or my in-laws, it's just my cross to bear, you know, it's my burden in life. And, uh, and I understand why we think of it that way. However, in the first century, when Jesus said to take up your cross, it meant death. It was, the cross was, was you were going to die. That's why he said, deny yourself. In fact, it's not just about denying yourself. You need to take it a step further and die to self. It's about forsaking everything and everyone to follow Jesus. Now, I'd like you to turn over to Luke 18, if you would, for just a moment, please. Luke chapter 18. And when you get to Luke 18, keep your finger there. We're going to be referring back to there, uh, that section in just a moment. But Jesus is basically saying, look, if you want to follow me, right on, good choice, but you need to forsake your own desires, your own wants, and your own will in following me. Uh, take a look at verse 18. Luke 18, verse 18. Another familiar story about the rich young ruler. It says in Luke 18, 18, Now, a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. <laughs> After first service, I walked up to a fellow. I said, hey, how you doing? He said, I'm good. I said, well, you know, the Bible says there's only one that's good, and I'm pretty sure you're not him. Uh, <laughs> so in verse 20, he said, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all these I've kept from my youth. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful for he was very rich. Now, <laughs> this rich young ruler wanted to follow Jesus. So, the advice Jesus gave him was the same advice he's given this scribe back in Matthew chapter 8. Forsake all, forsake everything, and follow me. Now, for you and I today, it's not that we have to give up everything. We just have to be willing to give up everything. God's looking for the willingness of our heart. I have found in my life, and you probably have too, that soon as we are willing to give it all up, that is typically when God says, okay, now you don't have to give it all up. We just have to be willing. <laughs> you know, many, many years ago when the church was first starting, I was very reluctant. I came kicking and scratching. Jeff, you were there. You were in our very first Bible study in our living room 25 years ago. We were what, 15? You haven't changed, you and Sean, you guys haven't changed a day in 25 years. Wow, it's amazing. I hate you both. But for us, I know for me, when the church was just starting, it, it, I came kicking and scratching I, because I thought God was going to take me someplace weird, you know, like the jungle or the desert or someplace really crazy, you know. And I thought, no, Lord, I don't want to do that, you know. And, and, and finally, I mean, I was literally in pain on the floor, I was dying. And uh, I finally acquiesced. I said, okay, Lord, whatever you want to do, I'm all in. I, I, I'm just willing to, to give it all up for you. I'm willing to forsake everything for you. And you know, that's when God says, okay, now you can stay. And you know, that is very typical in our lives. God just wants a willingness to give it up. It's not that we have to. Well, back to, keep your finger in Matthew, uh, Luke 18 and go back to Matthew 8, if you would, please. Uh, we said there were four things that are involved in following Jesus. Number one, it involves forsaking. Number two, it involves priorities. It involves priorities. That's in verses 21 and 22. And the inference is simply putting Jesus first, above and before everything and everyone. Uh, look at verse 21 back in Matthew 8. In verse 21, it says, Then another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Now, we're not told here, uh, but in the parallel account in Luke chapter 9, verse 59, Jesus starts this conversation with this other disciple. In fact, the first thing Jesus said to him in Luke chapter 9, verse 59, is, follow me. So Jesus made the first contact to this fellow, follow me. And it was after Jesus said that, according to verse uh, 21, that this fellow said, let me first go bury my father. Now, on the surface, this, of course, seems very rational, very reasonable, and something that we would normally think about doing. Look, I'd love to come right now, but I can't. I have more pressing business. I have to attend to the, the, the burial of my father. And of course, that, that certainly makes sense to all of us. However, it might be, it could be, there's a strong possibility that his father had not yet died. Because this little phrase, let me go bury my fathers, is oftentimes used as a Jewish idiom. Because in ancient times, the family unit, of course, was very important. And the sons would stay home to help run the family business, to help with the family food, to family security. You, you know, so the family unit was very, very important. And the inference is, hey, you know what? I have to stay here and help the family and run the business or watch over the household. 
but when the time comes and my father passes, I'll bury him and then I'll be free of this obligation, we might say. And that is probably what is happening here, which I find very interesting in light of many of us today because, you know, sometimes we have that same kind of ideology, that same philosophy. Say, Lord, I'm going to follow you, but, you know, first I want to finish my schooling. Lord, I'm going to follow you, but first I want to pay off my bills. Lord, I want to follow you, but first I want to retire. Lord, I want to, you, you follow me? We always put something first before the Lord. And I think the inference here that the, Jesus is driving home to this one fella is to simply put him first. Well, look at verse 22. But Jesus said to him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Wow. Now, on the surface, this sounds very harsh, very callous, very uncaring. Uh, but again, Jesus is driving home the point about priorities. We might even say, look, your father's not dead. Don't worry about it. You need to follow me. And when the time comes and his funeral is at hand, then you can go take care of that. And that seems to be the idea. Uh, turn, if you would, over to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, down in verse 37. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, Jesus is not minimizing the importance of family. Family, of course, is important. Uh, but the point is, are we putting our family first or are we putting Jesus first? That seems to be the point that's being driven home here. In fact, drop down to verse 37 of Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, look at verse 37. Jesus highlights this issue again. It says, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. So the question for us is which relationship are we putting first in our life? What is the priority one relationship in our life? Is it our family? Or is it Jesus? Follow me? Now, <laughs> turn back to Luke chapter 18. Your finger's already there. And go back to chapter 14. Look in Luke chapter 14. Because if that weren't enough, Jesus takes it up a notch and uses some incredibly powerful hyperbole to drive this point home even further. Uh, drop down to verse 26 of Luke chapter 14. In Luke 14, 26, Jesus said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his mother or his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and yes, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Wow. Uh, drop down to verse 33. Look at verse 33. So likewise, whoever does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. And this points to and speaks of priorities in our lives. Back in verse 27, this sounds very harsh. If we don't hate our family, we can't follow Jesus. Now, the idea here obviously isn't about hating family. Throughout the Bible, family is very important. However, the idea is... Our love for Jesus Christ is so great, our love for our family pales in comparison. In fact, it seems like hatred compared to our love for Jesus. So our, the love we have for our family seems like hatred compared to how much we love Jesus. That seems to be the hyperbole that Jesus is using here. And this points up to priority. And this is important for all of us because he's dealing with family. Look, I, I love my family, but hopefully my love for Jesus Christ is so much greater than my love for my family that my love for my family seems like hatred in comparison, follow me? And I think we can take it a step further toward our marriages. I mean, Sally and I have been together for almost 40 years. People say, well, how, how, how'd you swing that? I mean, what's your secret? Well, it's easy. Sally loves Jesus more than she loves me. <laughs> and I love Jesus more than I love her. 
It's about priority. It's about putting Jesus first above everything and everyone. In fact, we saw that back in Matthew 6, 33. Jesus said to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things shall be added unto you. Capish? Back to Matthew chapter 8. Let's come to the third thing we want to look at. We said there were four. What's involved in following Jesus? Number one, it involves forsaking. Number two, it involves priority. And number three, it involves faith. It involves faith. In verses 23 through 27, we have a very familiar story of Jesus and the disciples on the Sea of Galilee that involves faith. Take a look at verse 23. It says, now when he, Jesus, got into a boat, his disciples followed him. And suddenly a great tempest arose, a storm, so that the boat was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. So now they had left Capernaum. They're traveling along the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee down to the eastern side as they're coming toward the area of the Gergesenes or modern-day Kersey. And a great storm arose on the Sea of Galilee. Now, many of you have been on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, oftentimes when we go, the, the sea is glassy, it's calm, it's nice, it is just a beautiful early morning where our hotel's right on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, the sun's coming up over the Golan Heights, reflecting on the glassy Sea of Galilee, and you're out there, you know, reading or praying, it's, it's just very moving to be sure, because this is where Jesus was, it, it's a huge blessing. And then, of course, we have the boat ride. Now, a couple of times, there have been some pretty good storms on the Sea of Galilee when I was there, and uh, because the location of the Sea of Galilee, not really the location, but the elevation. The Sea of Galilee is about 680 feet below sea level, so it has a subtropical type of climate. They grow bananas, guavas, all, passion fruit. I mean, it's, it's, it's really an amazing place. Now, just north of the Sea of Galilee is a Mount Hermon or Mount Hermon. It rises some 9,200 feet above sea level. It's snow-capped all year long. It's called the crown of the Galilee because when you see it, it looks like it's a big white crown on the head of this mountain. It's pretty spectacular. But the cold air comes down from Mount Hermon. The hot air from plains of Sharon are sucked down into the uh, sub-basin of the Galilee, and that when the airs mix, of course, great storms can ensue. In fact, Daniel Carmel, our boat captain, uh, he's, been on the, he's lived on the Sea of Galilee virtually his whole life. He grew up in Haifa, a little to the north, but his, his uh, teenage and adult years were on the Sea of Galilee. And he says there are so violent storms that occur, their boats are just, big boats that on the sea are just overturned, and it becomes a very violent place, to be sure. Now, that's common occurrence, and, and of course, the interpretation, because of that's very simple. But what I found interesting is that Jesus' disciples, according to verse 23, got into the boat, and then there was a storm. Now, I think for you and I, there's a bit of application there, because when we decide to follow Jesus, it doesn't mean there's always going to be smooth sailing in our life. When we follow Jesus, you can expect some storms, some trials, some tribulations. In fact, as we saw back in Matthew chapter 7, verse 14, following Jesus involves a, a, a narrow gate and a, a, a difficult path, and there are few that go down it. In fact, in John 16, 33, Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. Woo. Yeah, that doesn't thrill me much either. But the truth of the matter is, storms are going to come. In fact, when I thought of Daniel Carmel, the boat captain, talk about storms, not just physical storms on the Sea of Galilee. Here's a guy who was born and raised in Israel, totally Jewish, who spent years as a boat captain on the Sea of Galilee with all us Christian groups coming week after week, singing songs to Jesus and having Bible studies about Jesus. He eventually came to faith in Jesus Christ. So he is now born again. And because of that, he's on fire for the, for the Lord. He plays the keyboard and sings. And so he started leading worship on his own, on the boat uh, that he was a captain on, singing Hebrew songs 
of the Christian songs we all know in Hebrew, and it was so amazing. Everybody wanted on Daniel's boat. Well, the other boat owners got very jealous, and they found out that he was born again, and they fired him, and he wasn't able to get any work. God opened a door for him to get his own boat. And over the years, he's been able to fix it up, and now he owns three boats. He named the first boat uh, Faith. The second boat was Hope. And the third, yeah, you got it. (laughs) And now he's just going big guns on the Sea of Galilee. Now they hate him even more. But the point is, (laughs) the point is, When we follow Jesus, there is going to be storms. Look at verse 25. This section goes on. Look at verse 25. Then his disciples came to him, awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. Now, now we're not told here, but in Mark's account, in Mark chapter 4, verse 38, they woke up Jesus and said, do you not care that we are perishing? In other words, Jesus was asleep, and in their mind's eye, it was because he didn't care that he was going to allow them to die. And when we get to chapter 14, Lord willing, we're going to have a similar situation when the disciples were on the Sea of Galilee with another storm, but this time it was Peter, Peter who stepped out of the boat and began to walk on water. The Bible says he saw the wind and the waves, and he began to sink. What happened? He got his eyes off of Jesus onto the storm and he began to sink. Same thing here. These guys got their eyes off of Jesus who according to verse 24 is asleep in the back of the boat and onto the storm and they began to freak out. They began to become fearful and the real problem is they lacked faith. In fact, take a look at verse 26. In verse 26, but he, Jesus said to them, Why did you wake me up, you knuckleheads? Oh, no, he didn't say that. (laughs) Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a calm. Boy, what a beautiful picture that is. Here, (laughs) Jesus rebukes not the disciples, which I would have. You woke me up for this? Are you kidding Follow me? But he rebuked the wind and the waves. I like that. And here, he says, O you of little faith. Now, in Luke's account, in Luke chapter 8, verse 25, he says, where is your faith? Now, last time we were together, we talked about the centurion's faith. He had great faith. The disciples here have little faith. And we saw that faith is not a quantity We often think of faith as a quantity because it talks about those who have great faith, those who have no faith, and those who have little faith. In fact, we saw last time we were together in Luke chapter 17, verse 5, the disciples said, Lord, increase our faith. And in verse 6 of Luke 17, he said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can move mountains and trees. So it's not about the quantity of our faith, it's about the object of our faith. And unfortunately, they were not putting their faith in Jesus Christ. And as a result of that, they were afraid. They were full of fear because of the storm in their life. Boy, does anybody understand what we're talking about? Hey, listen, this is where the rubber meets the road for all of us, to be sure. This is an important issue. Now, before we move on to the next point, we should mention that their lack of faith is in two areas according to our text. They lack faith in two areas. First of all, they lack faith in the word of the Lord. Now, this is subtle, but it's there. They lack faith in the word of the Lord. Back in verse 18, he commanded them to depart. In other words, he commanded them to get in the boat to leave Capernaum. And according to verse 23, when he got into the boat, they followed him. Now, It's subtle here, but in the parallel accounts, it's a little more powerful. In Luke chapter 8, verse 22, Jesus said, let us go to the other side. It's it's indicative. It's a statement of fact. In fact, in Mark chapter 4, verse 35, he said, let us go 
to the other side. In other words, Jesus said we are, in fact, going to the other side. He didn't say it would be smooth sailing, but he said we are going to get there. He did not say, boy, I hope we make it to the other side. Boy, I'm praying we get to the other side. He said, no, we are for sure going to get to the other side. And so too it is with us. We're going to get to the other side. We're going to get to heaven. Is everything going to be perfect between now and then? Mm, probably not. Are there going to be storms in our lives? Oh, yes. Trial, tribulation? Absolutely. Is there going to be lots of difficulty and danger and destruction on the path to heaven? Yes. Everyone okay? Now, I realize this is not a message to win friends and influence people. But it is certainly the truth of the Word of God. You see, they lacked faith in the Word of the Lord. And we, when we make that same mistake, we're going to sink as well. You know, Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Yeah, it's God's Word. Question, is everything in God's Word 100% right on the money? Oh, yes, no doubt about it. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, all of God's promises in Him are yes and amen. Look, if God said it, we can believe it. We can take it to the bank. Ephesians 1.3 says He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, by His divine power, He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness in this present age. Romans 8.37 says, we're more than conquerors. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, we're a new creation in Christ. The old things have passed away. All things are made new. So for you and I, man, we rest and rely upon the Word of God. We put our faith in it. So, number one, they lack faith in the Word of the Lord. Number two, the second area they lack faith is in the example of the Lord. The example of the Lord. At the end of verse 24, he was sleeping in the back of the boat. What was the example that Christ set for these guys who were freaking out because of the storm? One of rest, one of peace, one of tranquility. I mean, he was sawing logs. Now, he probably wasn't snoring. He's God. He doesn't snore. But uh, the, the, the point is, the point is, Jesus set that example for them as well as he set that example for us. You know, 1 Peter 2.21, the Bible says Christ is our example. We should follow in His footsteps. Same thing in John chapter 13, verse 15. He says, I've done this as an example that you should do as I have done. And when we put our faith in the Lord, it involves following His example. And what a beautiful thing that is. Because as a result of that, according to verse 26, at the end of the verse, it says there was a great calm. Now, once again, we know he's talking to the winds and the waves, not to the disciples, but I, I have to believe he wanted the disciples to see that example. Now, for you and for me, I believe the application is very simple. When the storms come up in our life, we need to put our faith in the word of the Lord and the example of the Lord, knowing that he'll bring a great calm <laughs> A great peace. You know, in the parallel accounts, in Luke's and Mark's account, Jesus told the wind and the wave, peace, be still. And there was a great calm. And so too, it can be in our hearts and in our lives. Precious family, no matter what we're going through or dealing with, no matter how terrible and tragic our circumstances may be, man, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, there's... Ah, there's just a rest. There's a peace. In fact, Paul in Philippians 4, 7, he says it's a peace that passes understanding. It guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. I don't get it. I don't understand it. How can I have so much peace in the midst of all this turmoil? I got Jesus. He is my peace, Ephesians 2, 14 declares. And he is the giver of peace, John 14, 27. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Therefore, let not your heart be troubled, nor be afraid. There's nothing to fear in life if Jesus is your peace. Back to Matthew. 
chapter 8. Let's come to the fourth and final thing, and we'll wrap this up right here. The fourth and final thing involves a choice. It involves a choice in verses 28 through 34. Take a look. In verse 28 of Matthew 8, it says, When he, Jesus, had come to the other side, to the country of the Gergesenes, he met, uh, they, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs exceedingly fierce so that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they cried out saying, what have we to do with you, Jesus, son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now they went to the region of the Gergesenes, uh, ancient Gadara. It's modern day Kersi. Uh, Kersi is on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, right below the Golan Heights. It's just north of uh, Kibbutz in Gev, where oftentimes we'll have a fish dinner. It's a very swanky little place. It's outdoors on the sea, very nice. And in 1970, uh, when they were putting in the road there on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, the bulldozers were cutting a path, they unearthed some uh, ruins, and it turned out to be a Byzantine-era Christian church, signifying the event of the two demon-possessed men. Because right above that Byzantine church were caves in the side of the hill. In fact, you can walk up to those today and, and explore them. And, and it, many believe that is where these demon-possessed men lived, thus building the church to signify the event of their healing. And we'll talk more on that in just a moment. But it's interesting. We learn two very interesting things about these two demon-possessed men in verse 29. First of all, they had good theology. Did you notice that? They had good theology. They called Jesus the Son of God. But second, they had good eschatology. They knew their final destination, of course, was the lake of fire in Revelation chapter 20, verse 15. So they had good theology and good eschatology. So the question is, did they believe that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah? Oh, yes, absolutely. They fully believed. In fact, in James chapter 2, verse 19, the Bible says that the demons do believe and tremble, but they chose not to follow. And I think for you and I, this becomes an interesting area for our lives because a lot of people believe that Jesus is who he says he is, but they're choosing not to follow him. Well, look at verse 30. It says, now a good way off from them was a herd of swine feeding. You say, Clark, what were pigs doing in Israel? Well, um, you know, every time we go to Israel, we're in these swanky restaurants, big, beautiful buffet breakfast. I mean, the food, the spread is amazing, is it not? It's just amazing. But inevitably, somebody will come up to me with a big plate of food with eggs and biscuits and fruit and vegetables and all these things, and they'll say, hey, where's the bacon? <laughs> this is a kosher hotel. We're in Israel. There's no pigs here. There's no bacon. So why is there pigs here? Well, the city of Gadara, or modern-day Kersi, is on the east side of the Jordan. It's, it's made up of what was called uh, the Decapolis. Uh, Deca, ten, polis is city. So it's a league of ten cities. There were nine cities on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee that were all Gentile, and one city on the western side in the Israel side, which is Skitopolis, or Beth Shan, magnificent ruins there. Uh, and these were Gentile, or Roman cities, and therefore the swine, the pigs. So, verse 31, the demons begged him, saying, if you cast us out, uh, permit us to go into the swine. And he said, go. So they came out, they went, uh, they went into the herd, they came out of the herd uh, and went into the, or came out of the two men, went into the herd of the swine, and suddenly the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place in the sea and perished in the water. Now, Many of you have been around the Sea of Galilee. I know I've been around it many, many, many times. And it is virtually flat all the way into the Sea of Galilee, all the way around, except for just a quarter kilometer maybe from Kersey. And it is the only place on the Sea of Galilee where a steep cliff exists even to this very day. And we always stop there and we get out and we can view the cliff and you can look back and just a short distance off is the city of Kersey or Gadara where the demons are. You can see the, the caves and the side of the hill. And this is no doubt the exact spot where all of this 
took place. Very interesting. Or not. Uh, in verse 33, it says, Then those who kept them fled, and they went away into the city, told everything, including what had happened to the two demon-possessed men. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they begged him to rent a large stadium, hire TV crews, and have a healing service. <laughs> oh, no, excuse me. They didn't say that. They spoke some of the saddest, most tragic words in all of Scripture. They begged him to depart from their region. Wow, very sad, very tragic. You see, they had a choice to make. And they preferred pigs over people. They preferred the things of the world above the people in the world. They chose to depart from the Lord and have him depart from them. You see, friends, this whole section involves a choice. And it's a choice all of us have because God loves us so much. He's given us a free will. And there's no middle of the road, by the way, as it pertains to Jesus. There's no sitting on the fence. There's none of this, well, I haven't really decided yet. Oh, yes, you have. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, either you are for me or you are against me. Either you gather with me or you scatter abroad. Look, there's no middle of the road in Christianity. Either we're in or we're out. So this is a very important issue. Now, just there is a little silver lining in it, by the way. Uh, in Mark's account, in Mark chapter 5, verse 18, we are told that one of the demon-possessed men came back and said he wanted to follow Jesus. So they had to make a choice. Once they were delivered, if you will, to choose to follow the Lord or not. You know, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, when Moses was addressing the children of Israel in the wilderness, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, he said, Today I set before you life and death. Blessings and curses. Therefore, choose life and live. And as we bow our hearts and our heads before the Lord, as Handel comes out, the question that faces each and every one of us is very simple. Have you decided to follow Jesus? You know, maybe you're here today and you've just been kind of going through the motions in life regarding Christianity, regarding a relationship with Jesus Christ. Or maybe you've walked away from God. Maybe you're just not really sure if you're going to heaven at all. Look, whatever the case may be, right here, right now, you can be absolutely sure that you're saved. You can be guaranteed in your eternal life will be in heaven with Jesus. And all you have to do is ask. Maybe you need to get right with God. Maybe you need to come back to the Lord. Dedicate your life to Him. Or maybe you've never given your life to Him. Look, whatever the case may be, right here, if God's tugging on your heart, I just want to pray for you. You don't have to stand up. You don't have to go anywhere or do anything. All you have to do is believe in your heart. All you have to do is say yes to Jesus. If that's what you want, I want to pray for you. You just slip up your hand real quickly so I can see it. If that's your desire, yes, God bless you. Yes, right over here, God bless you. Maybe you're outside on the patio or in the overflow room. Look, wherever you're at, yes, God bless you, young man. I see your hand. You can put it down. God bless you, yes. God bless you. Look, don't put this decision off another day because I don't know what tomorrow holds. Life is short, but I do know who holds tomorrow. Now, before I pray for you, I'd like you to pray this prayer. You just pray it in your heart. Say, Jesus, right here, right now, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I ask you to become my Lord and my Savior. And that from this day forward, I put you first above everything and everyone as I follow you. And Lord, I do pray 
that you would bless those who've made that decision for you today. Father, that you would touch their hearts, encourage their lives, that you would lead, guide, and direct them as they follow after you. Bless them richly, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask, amen, amen.